Good evening, everyone. No, no, let's try that again. It's Chicago. Good evening, everyone. My name is uh, Chef Cliff Rome. Uh, I'm the owner of a company called um, RJC Companies, which is comprised of Peaches Restaurant on the, 40, on the corner of 47 The King Drive in the heart of Bronzeville. We also own the Parkway Ballroom. Yeah, come on, let's give it up. <laughs> Southside. <laughs> we own Rome's Joy Catering, and uh, we are foodies. So it is, uh, it is my pleasure to be here with Chef Tw uh, Twitty today. Uh, we uh, chopped it up literally here at the Chop House. We were talking a little bit back there in the back just about food and culture, and, and uh, I know you guys are anxious to kind of hear what he has to say, uh, all these great things that are happening with this book. So when we're done, you better run over there and go ahead and get your book. Is that right? That's right. <laughs> um, so as we start to talk about food service, uh, we start to talk about um, things that are very similar, right? And so when we're saying you start to think about things that are important to you, when you sit around a table, generally you eat, you drink wine, you listen to music. All those things make you comfortable and you start having conversations. And so part of what's happening in this book and part of the, the experience as culinarians is that you start to research certain things. Certain things kind of come to life. And through this book and his explorations of Chef Twitty, where he went, what he was doing, what he's talking about, these are things that are very sentimental, things that are very touching to the heart, correct? And I think that what happens now is that you literally get a chance to look at this or listen to us and, and, and obviously read the book and get a great sense of where he's coming from. So I'd like for all of you to give him a round of applause, please. Thank you. Thank you. So I have some prepared questions, but let's, let's just talk about you and how long have you been in the industry and, and kind of how you got started and, and what food kind of means to you. <laughs> you say industry and I'm going, okay. Um, I, I, I had to carve my own niche. Right. Um, my goal was to become, is to become, was, is um, ongoing to become the first um, completely proficient black colonial and antebellum style chefs of the Civil War. Because our ancestors were not second best caterers. They were not second best restaurateurs and tavern owners. They were number one. In the same way that people associated laundry with the Chinese immigrants and associated other businesses with other ethnic groups, they associated excellent cooking with black men and women. And whether they were in chains or whether they were free people of color. And so for me, living in a time and an age where every chef fancies himself or herself a culinary historian without the paperwork. <laughs> That's true. Um, but, you know, the upsell is in the story of the food, the ingredients, the recipes. But I've always asked in my work, what about the people? Um, that's the hard part. How do we embody and engender those people in their lives? And what food, how food empowered them? And how food um, helped them create new lives for themselves? You know, I, you, you can read any number of Southern cookbooks or books about Southern food that dismiss us with, with two lines. First line is, the slaves contributed. How are you gonna contribute something when your hands are tied behind your back with chains? That's the first question. The second question is, this notion of contribution belies um, the practice of theft. You know, let me, let me revise this sentence for you so you understand what I'm talking about. Upper and middle class Jews between the world wars contributed their art collections to Hitler. <laughs> you feel it now? That's what we feel like every day. Every day. Not every day. Every day. Every day. <laughs> so the, the Native Americans, we're going to tell that lie to every school kid in about a month, right? The Native Americans contributed corn, beans, pumpkins, and squash, and turkeys. And all they, and you know what? If, if, uh, my friend Sean Sherman, I told him he should have a, a shirt made. I contributed corn, beans, squash, and turkeys, and all I got was a smallpox blanket. <laughs> <laughs> you 
Yeah, we, not, we, we, we ain't doing a kumbaya yet. Not tonight, y'all. Um, so that it doesn't sound right, does it? It sounds quite awful. So that's why I think, for me, the first element is authenticity. Right. Um, yeah, people want to grow Carolina Gold Rice, but nobody wants to touch that slavery thing. Right. So you know what? Our ancestors had a, had a wonderful folktale that teaches us the lesson of this. This is where I, this is where I got my stuff from, man. And that folktale was about you know a rabbit mm -hmm. and a fox. You've heard that one. Oh, I and, think so. Yeah, and, and the fox was going to you know, excoriate and torture that rabbit. And what did the rabbit say? Throw me in the briar patch. Yeah. Basically said, send me back home. Right. And, I'll do, and, and it'll do me a world of damage. Well, all I told the cooking world was send me back home, home being the old South, home being the plantation, where I knew certain people would not fear to tread. Right. But that's okay, because I'm used to briars. I got 400 years worth of briars. And so for me, from a culinary perspective, it was more than just let's, not, let's stop worshiping ingredients. Let's stop worshiping techniques and recipes. Let's stop worshiping food and start understanding the, the ethical importance of understanding the, the people that make the food. Mm -hmm. That's where it's at. If we're really gonna be ethical human, if we're really gonna be, have these American ideals that we purport to have, then put your damn fork down and start praying again. You know. My man, <laughs> I love it. So l listen, let's talk about this. You talk about your plate is your flag. Yes, sir. Tell us what the Southern Discomfort Tour is and why you took it. It's never ending. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's more discomforting now than it was when I took it originally. Um, no, I really wanted to, um, I started to have that amnesia thing that everybody thinks they're immune from. And it started to get to me that I could tell you generic things about who I was, where I came from, my ancestors, mm -hmm. but we're starting to forget. And I realized there were places in this vast family tree that I'd never been to before. I'd never seen with my own two eyes. I'd never seen a plantation my people were on or the land they were on. I had never seen this. I'd never done that. There were places in the South I'd never been to. And so we raised money in Indiegogo. We um, set out from Eastern Shore of Maryland and Southern Maryland all the way to East Texas from Missouri to Florida. Mm -hmm. Three big, three big trips, and then there were all basically every other chance I got to do like a two or three week trip, I kind of grandfathered on to what I call the Southern Discomfort Tour. So the point was that you know Southern food is a billion dollar industry. Ain't no such thing as like a Midwest restaurant. <laughs> Stop it. Per Perkins don't count. Ain't no such thing, ain't no such thing as a New England style restaurant. Red Lobster don't count, I care what Beyonce <laughs> said. Ain't no such thing as a Southwest style restaurant. No, 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 Chipotle really don't count. <laughs> or Pacific Northwest, but we have an a, a international, multi-billion dollar idea mm -hmm. of what Southern food is. But that food is marketed and sold and talked about as if nobody suffered to create it as if nobody's still suffering to create it. Correct. You know, um, so I wanted to bring light to that, but also I wanted to, I wanted to break down my own walls and barriers because I was going into, I, when we did the initial, the initial tours, it was the summer of the second Obama election. Okay. Which is a very difficult time to be in the Deep South. Um, they weren't too happy about Romney, but they sure didn't want him. I'm sure. And so it was scary. It, it wasn't like, you know, 1963 scary, mm -hmm. but it was, it, was, it was definitely scary. But also I had, to, I had to force myself to talk to white Southerners. That's something that we don't seem to want to do is talk to the other side. Um, and so I forced myself to talk to white Southerners of all stripes and having conversations about, are we related? No, no, forget the has pimento cheese. Right. Are we kin? You, are you my blood? Do your people own my people? Are we cousins? And if we're family, then we need to have a new relationship with each other. We don't have time for any nonsense. Let's really get to what's, what, what is, what's your issue? Let me tell you what my issue is. 
And so that's what we really developed into. And furthermore, it was just an opportunity for me to actually go back over this family tree that stretched back three centuries and revise it and really learn where I came from. The bottom line is, y'all, I wanted to put the microscope on my own body, soul, and spirit. If I was gonna be a historian, a teacher, arm, armchair, I didn't wanna be an armchair historian. I wanted to be the kind of person that said, you know what, I'm picking my 300 pounds of cotton. Right. So I know what that's like. I done worked tobacco field many a day, not just once, but many a day. I done barn tobacco, I know what that is. I've been in a rice field, although stupidly in sandals. <laughs> So, so the thing is that you had to be comfortable with being uncomfortable yes. and having those types of conversations. Yes, because that's what makes you intelligent. Not being comfortable is not, is not good enough. Right. I mean, our father, Yaakov, didn't become, you know, Israel because he was uncomfortable. He had to get a broken hip to earn that name. Right. So we, you know, that's the bottom line for us. It's that, it's that experience that young men and young women learn in West Africa when they become men and women. They have to go through a period of suffering and re-understanding of who they are and who they are in relationship to their ancestors so they can have a relationship with their children. Right. So I had to put myself through the same gauntlet and put that microscope on myself and be willing to, to you know, you know, get DNA results and be like, am I who I think I am? Or do I have to revise the myth about, I've made about myself? You know, um, am, I gonna be, am I gonna be okay with this? Um, I, and basically, can we, have a, can we have somebody who cooks in America talk about the roots of their food beyond just them? You, you see in plenty of cookbooks where people talk about grandma, grandpa for a couple paragraphs and it's right back to them. Because right. most of us only know three generations. And that's where, the, that's where we all start over again. Mo, that's most people on the planet. You get three generations and that's it. They don't take a deeper dive. Mm-mm. So going back further to me was important. So since we're talking about family, so most of us grew up in the kitchens with our grandparents. Yeah. And so you talk about your grandmother dunking her cornbread in yes. the buttermilk. Yes. And, and, and your dad making you taste the dirt. Yeah. Right, of the earth. So when you talk about your family, tell us why genealogy is a big part of, of the story, of the narrative. Oh, of you. course. And I've gotten a lot of, I've gotten not a lot. I, should, I shouldn't say that. I'm the kind of person you can kiss me a million times, but slap me once, and I'm more worried about the slap than a million kisses. <laughs> so, um, but a couple, but, a, but there has been like this little chorus of, why are there no more recipes? Because it's not a cookbook. <laughs> you want a cookbook, go, go to Paula Dean. Get, get, you, get your little cookbook. Uh-oh, uh-oh. Mm. I guarantee you she stole her recipe from black folks, so that's all right. <laughs> You want a cookbook. Is this thing called the internets? The Google? <laughs> Googles. The Googles, many, as many recipes for barbecue as you want. But um, there are recipes sprinkled in it, 30 some recipes sprinkled in it. But some people were just like, he spent so much time talking about his genealogy. Well, I'm so sorry. You have to spend 15 pages learning about black people's lives. <laughs> The, 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 the names I got back from my great, 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 and great, 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 great grandparents, which almost no black person in America can do, thanks to a several hundred year cultural genocide. I'm so sorry that hurts your feelings that you really want to go back to talking about techniques and recipes and ingredients, because that's what's important, right? <laughs> I don't know grandma's name, but she definitely didn't put sugar in her cornbread. <laughs> What the hell is that? What is that? What is that? So, you know, for me, also the genealogy part was about saying to people, don't, um, one of my, I'm, I'm the first um, revolutionary resident of Colonial Williamsburg. And one of the things that we have an issue, what I have an issue with there is that people, we don't teach history and culture. Mm -hmm. we, we, we put that behind all the rest as if that's trivial. But you can't have an adequate, you know, are, you, are you running around arguing about chemistry? Or geometry, perhaps? Are you are, are, are about dangling participles? But y'all talking about race, sexuality, gender, and everything else, right? Did you study it in school adequately? Probably not, and they still not. 
So why do we have this, well, this incredibly important part of being human missing from our educational system? Okay? Or at least fomenting a dialogue. So for me, you know, you can't have adequate dialogues about these big issues that are always creating more and more flashpoints every day with our, me with our current media cycle and social media cycle and not know who you are. I mean, or I wanted people to know, when I talk about slavery, I'm not playing some slavery card. Nah, baby, here is the picture of the people in my family who wore the chains. These are, these are, these are my ma'afa, we say in Swahili, it's the same, it's the equal to the term Shoah, disaster. These are my survivors of the, the great disaster known as slavery. So here they are, they're for real. And I saw what people did to Alex Haley. I know his family. His, when his, when his nephews is um, um, the director of African American research at the archives in the state of Maryland, um, and they tore Alex Haley up. Now, whether or not you feel that his narrative was completely 100% legit is not the issue. That's not why they tore Alex Haley up. They tore Alex Haley up because he put the dream in every black person's heart that there was, that 1619 did not define you. That you could cross that Atlantic Ocean and be a whole person. And that pissed people off because they didn't want us to have that. They want us to assimilate and that's it. They wanted to be right. And see, Alex said, no. Nope. So when I go in this book, when you see that big family tree, which by the way, thanks to the miracle of social media, is actually expanded since the book was published. <laughs> right. It's like this. I wanted people to know, you ain't gonna do to me what you did to get to our Uncle Alex. When I started this book, I went to his grave and I prayed. I was like, no, nah, I'm starting this book off right. Is that why you, you decided to put on the clothes, go and pick the tobacco? All of it. That, when, I, when, I'm a, when, I'm a, when I'm a historic um, interpreter, I'm not a reenactor, reenactors are crazy. <laughs> There's a difference. Right? There's a difference. Their, honey, their drag is old. My drag is new. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the first time I went to a, to a rendezvous, French and Indian War rendezvous, and I was paid to come there and do my cooking thing, and some dude was playing, and he was reenacting a Mohawk native person, and he went out in the woods about I don't know how many paces, did his business without a single square to spare, came back and tried to shake my hand. I said, I know I'm not a reenactor. <laughs> Y'all better get me back on in the house while you got a chance. So I was like, nah. So, so seriously, reenactors and interpreters both have very important roles to play. Um, we're running out of people who know how to do these skills. Right, yeah, that's true. Period. So there are reenactors who are, I mean, God bless them. They're very excellent at what they do. I just feel like they tend to be more conservative, traditional. We tend to more, be more progressive, moderate. We, we take the clothes off at five o'clock. They don't. Right. They're happy living that life for a, a, a weekend or a week or, week, or two weeks straight. Uh-uh. I, I know, my, I love it, but I know my limits. And I also know I cannot engage with slavery for more than tw 24 hours. It just, it's, mm -mm. no. Even having to do like the, the spiel with visitors at CW takes a toll on me and I have to do something else when I'm done with what I'm doing. Um, so that's the place of subversion. I mean, because I know back in the old days when we would work at these places, like Milton Place in South Carolina or um, you know Monticello, we would wear those clothes, we were supposed to be the happy slave in the kitchen. And I put them on a place of subversion because I ain't gonna give you that narrative right. at all. And it's not because I don't like white people. Um, it's because I love them enough to tell the truth to them. There's a difference. And so for, for us, I, I always tell people white guilt is not one of my key ingredients. You know, paprika is. <laughs> Parsley is important because, you know, presentation. But white guilt doesn't sprinkle well. But it's not about that. It's about making sure all of us are on the up and up. That all of us are patently clear that we don't ever want to see enslavement again. And that means even down to the shoes we wear and the iPod we put in our ear. It's about contemporary relevance as much as it's about the past. It's, they go hand in hand. 
And the food is the vehicle for the conversation. Right. Because I may not be, I can't, I can't walk up to the, the Red Hats that often, often come visit us and say, okay, let's have a talk. Right. Or say, would you please, can I introduce you to the Cherokee warriors down the streets that can scalp you, perhaps? <laughs> no. I have to be able to say the words, all right, I'm Michael Twitty, I'm a culinary historian. I'm not playing a slave. Thank you very much. Oh, I hate it when people go, so you guys sl sleep in there, right? Oh my God. <laughs> you guys sleep in there. No, sir. We guys don't sleep in a slave cabin. Nope, that's, that's not our home. We're not, no, no. You're talking about our ancestors. Have some respect. And they were not slaves, ladies and gentlemen. They were enslaved. One is a condition, the other one's an identity. Get that mess straight. They were not masters. You don't even, you wouldn't even call, your, call yourself the master of your Labrador retriever. No, I'm his companion. <laughs> I am companion to Fifi. Ain't none of y'all talking about his, um, Fifi's master. I had to say it like that, didn't I? Master. <laughs> T-U-H. <laughs> right? And so as so we say slaveholder, we want people to, 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 to reclaim the language. And as much as I'm reclaiming the recipes in those spaces, because those people who were cooking were themselves subversive. They were incredibly powerful on a level that we're, that we're not used to hearing spoken about enslaved people. They weren't all, they weren't, omni they weren't um, completely powerful. They had limits, but they were extremely powerful in what they did. And the kitchen was also a space of negotiated power. I mean, I didn't, we didn't become part white because of any other room but the kitchen. And I say that in the book. The, the kitchen was where the rapes took place. Because the kitchen, remember, in the Old South, in the Colonial South, was an off building. And it was, it was where Big Missy feared to tread. But when, that, when, her, when her back was turned, her sons, her overseer, her husband took advantage of our grandmothers in those spaces. I mean, it's, it's not easy for me to talk about it to you as much as it is for me to think about or when I learned it the first time. Wondering, why is my grandmother different? Why does my grandmother have gray eyes and red hair and skin like my palm? But she still has my nose and my lips. Why? We, have to, we, we grow up thinking, we, have, we look at ourselves and go, how come Michael Twitty got all this straight hair in his arm and a beard that grows like this? How come my hair don't fro? Mine does. Yours does. <laughs> but mama's hair didn't fro. And then her brother's and her daddy's hair didn't fro. Right. So you got to ask all these questions. And so then you learn that Harry Townsend was a mulatto boy, that he was nine when he was sold from his mama. And Harry Townsend more than likely had straight hair. Probably had straight hair when he ran away when he was 16. He was captured by a man named Mr. Frazier for the sum of $5. You know, was marched from North Carolina to Richmond, and then from Richmond was walked on foot to Alabama. Then tried to run away from Alabama at age 16 with another young man named Henry. Henry got caught and he got caught. He was summarily punished and then valued at a th over $1,000 when he was in his late 20s. That's why I have to know every single detail because these were the people eating the food and cooking the food, you know? I don't know of anybody else who's done this. Right. That's why it was so scary for me to write this book because when, when nobody's done it before, you know, what do you do with yourself? How do you, how do you create a narrative out of that? That's tough being the first. Well, so everyone has a definition of soul food, right? Mm -hmm. um, and you say food created by people with amnesia and massive Stockholm syndrome. Mm -hmm. that's, that's strong, man. It's deep. <laughs> Trying to cook their way um, to some semblance of understanding. Yeah. Like, talk about that. So I call, I call soul food with the, with the big S, the vernacular cuisine of African Americans that is the memory cuisine of the great grandchildren of enslaved people. So these are people in the southern black southern diaspora, mm -hmm. northeast, midwest, west coast, remembering backwards. Because now they're, they're, they're in a space where they've never been before. They're surrounded by other 
people, but they're no longer a, a, a racialized class. Well, they are, but they're also an ethnic group now. Right. So everybody else has their ethnic thing going on and vice versa. So they're trying to figure out what defines us in relationship to these other people who obviously have their thing. So what's our thing? What makes us us? When you're, you know, when you're, when you're um, cold, and by the way, next time I come to Chicago, tell them to pay the heating bill. <laughs> it's not even cold yet. This is, it's, to me, this is January weather. You're, you're kidding me. And it's like, okay, so what do we do with ourselves? And then there's soul food with, with the um, little s, mm -hmm. which I sometimes used to describe the whole of the vernacular African-American food tradition, um, not bound by geography or time. So yeah, I mean, when you didn't have access to certain things, you pop open a can. So the food of enslaved people is the same thing as soul food. But without the food of enslaved people, soul food would never be. They're sort of like, it's almost like a proto right. soul food, a proto southern food. And also I, just, I like to talk about that for a second, southern versus soul. Because I think some people go, well, wasn't it all just the same thing, really? Passive aggressive smile. <laughs> no, because you know what? I don't really, I've never read one single narrative of a poor white person in the South getting their brains beat out for taking a piece of cornbread or a biscuit. You know, the, it's, it is the, the class, the laws, the rules, mm -hmm. the, the caste system of slavery that essentially separates those two diets permanently from each other. So yes, it's, uh, well, it's, like, it's like this. If I asked you to describe an egg bread that's braided, that's from Eastern Europe, what do you call that? Okay, thank you for going the Jewish angle, but it could just equally be, it could equally be a Cossack dish too, couldn't it? It could, be, it could be Coolidge bread for Easter, but the Cossacks were beating our asses. So <laughs> whose bread is it? Now, this is why it's important not just to be black. Right. To, have, no. be, to be out of my bubble. Because if I was just in my bubble, I couldn't describe that to people. But now I think they, now I think they understand. Your cornbread versus my cornbread versus egg bread versus Coolidge. Challah versus Coolidge. One bread is for, for Shabbat and for the holidays, Jewish holidays. The other bread is for Easter. This bread is being eaten by somebody who's going to come into my community and, and, and do a pogrom. This bread is for the people being beaten <laughs> during the pogrom. Right. Now, they may be similar, but they ain't the same. That's why I'm, that's when I say, yeah, they got their turnip greens and ours are better. <laughs> we kind of talked about the, the idea of cooking, right? So mm -hmm. when, when my grandmother cooks from New Orleans, it's distinctly different from my grandmother when she cooks from Michigan, mm -hmm. right? And so if a person comes to the restaurant and says, well, I'm gonna have some gumbo, and I decide I'll make gumbo like my grandmother from Michigan, then they say, well, wait a minute, this is, this is not authentic, this is, this is crazy, <laughs> what are you doing? He can't cook. So part of the conversation is that, right? Right, it's about performance. Like, I suffer from that all the time. It's, it's you know, performance anxiety, ha <laughs> ha. Um, it's, like, it's like this. People, ex people expect me to perform being Jewish in a certain way, perform being black a certain way, perform being gay a certain way, perform being Southern a certain way. And I didn't ask you. This is a one-man show. <laughs> you don't write the script. Right. In the, same way, in the same way both of us, when we make our grandmother's cooking and then put our own stamp on it, mm -hmm. we're going to do it in our way, and we're going to make it a certain way. And that's an equally valid performance of our heritage cooking. Right. Um, so, so some people won't let you perform being black because they don't like being, people being vegan or vegetarian. You know, and I'm like, wait a minute. That's what our culture is built on improvisation. It's built on intuition. Um, it's built on transcendence. I mean, we're the only people who name their cuisine or something transcendental. We're the only people who named the cuisine into something that transcends the boundaries of life and death, that bonds your ancestors with your children. So therefore, we have no excuse to put each other in bubbles and boxes because they do us no good. So that's why I tell people, mind your own performance. 
perform you the best you can. But don't, don't, interrupt, don't interrupt my performance. Don't critique it because you're not the artist of this. There's only one artist of it. The creator and me working in partnership together. Is that why it's so important to reinsert African Americans into this, this culinary culture? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, when, so, no, so now more people who listen to NPR are literate, they know more about James Hemings. But I start this book with James Hemings and I'm getting dressed. The first thing is me getting dressed, getting ready to work, do a day's work cooking on a plantation. But I invoke James's name very early on and the men and women like him because I want you to know that the, that the greatest cook early America had was a black man from a plantation in Virginia who went to France and learned to cook at the court of Versailles. And nobody in early America had that culinary pedigree. And that blending of French technique um, and Western know-how with African ingredients, flavors, and recipes is what created this gourmet Southern cooking. And it wasn't pretty. It's the thing about it is, I want you to understand, when people came to different plantations, inns, and taverns and ate this food, it was African food. It wasn't pretty. It wasn't plated up nice. I, and I can tell you time and time again, people complaining about how ugly the food was. It wasn't, wet. It wasn't you know, that Eurocentric thing going on, right? right? But the bottom line was they said they, they couldn't have eaten anything better. So when Patrick Henry, I, was like, well, I think it was Patrick Henry, describes Thomas Jefferson's table, he's really talking about James Hemings, he said it's half Virginian and half French in style, served in good taste and abundance. Well, you know what he means by half Virginian. <laughs> you know. Soul. Soul. And so that's, so that's, that's the thing. We, if we, you gotta know these ancestors, but you also have to know the descendants too. There's so many black folks right now who are doing beautiful things and bartending. You know, what's the sister does the sushi and the other people, we do everything. Oh, yeah. We don't just do black and black diaspora food. But the bottom line is, I'm trying to give them an opportunity. I wanted them to have a blueprint. I want them to have, as we say in Yiddish, a yichus, a pedigree. Now you didn't tell me where I came from, I told you. You know, I, I have a history. This is, this, is, this is part of my heritage. You know, I don't have to learn from someone else who's not me to know what my heritage is. Is that culinary justice? That's part of it. Because food justice is about access. Access to decent food, healthy food, food that um, is nutritious, food that um, helps you survive, do more than survive. Culinary justice is about the fact that we do live in a capitalistic economy where ideas are capital. And when you are oppressed, how you survive your oppression is your greatest form of capital. Always has been. Um, so, you know, <laughs> it's, it's all there. So, we talked about your Civil War enact, you know, reenactments. Yeah. Right? Will you continue on on that path of constantly researching and taking a deeper dive, or is that is that one chapter that you've already uncovered and now you you you're looking I at think, something else? I think I think until I'm satisfied that I'm actually at that point of proficiency, where I can tr teach other people. My ultimate goal is to open up a field school where I can teach. Um, multiple folks, everything I've learned. In the course now, it's going on 20 some years, 25 some years. Because I was like, I was, a, I was a precocious little kid doing this, doing this stuff. I mean, if you, if you add on interviewing the grandparents, not because my parents told me, because I just loved them. I just really wanted to know more about them. I thought that the world they came from was terrifying and yet thrilling. I liked, I liked knowing that they made something out of nothing. You know, um, going to the garden with them and cooking with them and other things, it wasn't, hey, I have a chore for you to do. It was the fun for me. Right. Going to work in the field with my daddy was fun because my father and I did not share sports, other things like other fathers and sons did. We did share barbecue. We did share hunting and fishing, and we did share farming. And I knew what my grandparents meant when I said, that's a pretty field of tobacco. <laughs> or when, it, when its lane is cut clear, that's a pretty feel. I wonder what it's gonna grow in it. I'm just like, you know, have that kind of agrarian thing going on. Um, I feel like the last generation to really embody that. 
I'm not, I'm not ashamed of them. Um, I'm very proud of them because without them, to me, they are the greatest generation. They put up with things that I, I, couldn't, I couldn't put up with. I'd be in Russia or Paris with you know, Paul Robeson and Baldwin. I couldn't have lived it. And my family did have that life. I talk about that in the book. Mm -hmm. My family went to England because my grandfather um, negotiated railway unions in um, Africa as it was rising out of colonialism. And so my family kind of did escape to England and East Africa for three to four years during the height of civil rights. Um, and my mother got a whole different education on what the world was. And I could have been, you know, and I've already decided Idris Elba's gonna play me in my autobiography. <laughs> Cause you know, we all look alike. <laughs> and I don't care if he plays me at 12, 24, 6 to 8. Idris, call a brother, C call me Luther. <laughs> So yeah, so that's, that, that was part of our own family story. We, we left this country um, to get away. And I could, have been, I could have been a Brit, but my family came back. And I ended up being the child of not a Caribbean or African man, but another African American whose family went back to slavery. We all had those stories. I remember um, sitting with my grandmother and you know, we had a garden. We grew up on the, I grew up on the south side of Chicago. So we had a vacant lot right next door turned into a garden. And she would sit out there for hours. We would pick weeds on Saturday mornings. I hated that. And I understood what the difference between collard greens and mustard greens and turnip greens. Mm -hmm. and, and she didn't call it thyme. It was thyme, right? You fresh <laughs> thyme. So I learned all my herbs and things. But at, at that point, it was an opportunity to, to, to sit with a library, right? Yes. And we talked about this a little bit backstage. When, when you start to think about libraries, this, this historical... Um, cultural tour that you've been taking that was submerged in food or about food, it's like that library that's never ending. Mm -hmm. But you said it was like a lot of books are missing. Yeah, it's like you, you, sit, you sit down with all these people, right? White folks, black folks, native folks, other folks coming into the South, but especially the folks who are like foundational. And I would interview these, you know, I remember this 90-year-old white man from a Husky, North Carolina. And I, I just decided that every time I would interact with elders in particular, mm -hmm. I would take the time to talk with them and record them and write down notes. Because everyone had a little bit of the story. It was like, you know, the whole thing with the blind man, the elephant? Yeah. But nobody knew what the whole elephant looked like, but they all had pieces of it. And so I would talk to them and the white folks would say, well, we had this lady who cooked for us. And I realized something, that woman probably didn't go home and talk about what she did at work. She kept her, she compartmentalized her lives her working life, and her life, and her family. And sometimes when these people would testify about, we had an old colored mammy, first time I heard that, I wanted to scream. And then I got sense and said, you know what, this person is 90 years old. They're from Husky, North Carolina. They don't know any better. Let me investigate this, this person's life so that one person out of multiple billions can record something about her so she didn't live in vain. Not to her children or her husband. Obviously, she was the center of their world. But as a culinary genius, I want to record her life, his life. And so I started to interview each elder. And what, and it's just not just the elders, the kids too. Because you know something, the children pick up on things, sometimes elders don't even know what they're doing. Mm. They see things. There's one young lady, she was like 13, and she says, my granddaddy eats black eyed peas half cooked. And I never heard that before. And then three weeks later, I'm reading through this uh, ethnography that Carl Lamon, who was a uh, missionary in the Congo, he, it, I mean, it was page whatever of volume three, and he goes, um, among the old Negroes here, they eat their um, pigeon peas and their cow peas half cooked because it makes them feel fuller. And I, I, did, I lost contact with the, the girl I wanted to just tell her, this is, this is you. This is your, this is your story. This is part of you. But for a lot of us, you, you gotta understand folks, we don't really have that. So I, had, I wanted to put all that stuff into a, a book so that our people could go, wow, grandma and them did that. Like when I was in Senegal in June and we walked past this man's house and he says, come on in, we got fruit. And I started buying fruit from him and I saw these herbs growing by the door and I said, 
what's that? He says, basilic. And I just, my jaw dropped because my Virginia grandmother and my Alabama grandmother, born about 13 years apart, both told me growing up, we grow basil by the door for good luck. Wow. And so I told him this, and he, he smiled, and he took his finger, and he went to my head. He goes, Senegal. <laughs> you know, you, and I, I kept having moments like that where I was just being told, of course you heard this from your elders. Who do you, where do you think you come from, young man? You're us. Just like with Southerners. We're, we are one family of Southerners, no matter what color we are. Right. We're dysfunctional as hell family. <laughs> But we're, it doesn't, doesn't, doesn't obviate the fact that we are inextricably connected. Talk about your ideas and similarities between um, Jewish and African-American or African slave traditions. So I will warn you that the next big book is more on that subject. It's about being black and being Jewish and how food, how, how I use food to negotiate that identity. Um, still not a cookbook. No, we, we, need, we, need, we need more than just recipes. We need narratives people's lives. So people can, I remember when I first started doing this thing, and people would just shake their head at me and go, too, meant too much, muddy waters, too many things. And I, and I realized something. I realized if I didn't push to have my thing documented and people like me documented, someday people are going to look back and say we never existed. What, what, what a shitty thing just to be able to, 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 to know that you could be erased from history if you didn't try hard enough. That's why I do what I do. So people can never say I didn't exist. Um, so for me, someone said, my friend Carolyn uh, in, Bo in Boston, she's a modern Orthodox um, MIT student. She's a um, homemaker, great cook. She says, for you, every day is Pesach. You are Pesach. You are Passover. This idea that it's our festival where we celebrate liberation from slavery, going to freedom, getting out of the narrow place, Mitzrayim. The name for Egypt in Hebrew it literally means the narrow place. Um, so she's right. She's like, this is, he's, she's just like, your life journey is like steps in a Haggadah, steps leading from slavery to freedom. And I was like, that's, that's cool. I never thought of it that way. I think I guess I'm so deep in it, I don't realize sometimes. But for me, you know, the first thing was getting out of the bubble. You know, when you look at Jewish food, when Jewish food, I don't mean just mean Ashkenazi food. Mm -hmm. I mean Sephardic food, Mizrahi food, Ethiopian food, Indi Jew Indian Jewish food, you know, nothing, it's not Ashkenormative, our conversation. Um, some of y'all know what I mean. <laughs> um, but the bottom line is, is that you know, global, the, the Jewish diaspora, the African diaspora have been oftentimes in the same places. And the fact of the matter is having to negotiate. And so for me, I think it's like, it's not just the, it's not about ingredients, it's more about the, 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 the mental and spiritual ingredients of the food. Our food has irony and humor, satire. Who else does this? You know, we, our food has memory attached to it. I mean, I, in my community, we had Greek folks, we had French folk, we had Chinese folk, you know, some of the greatest, we had Italian folk, for the, some of the greatest culinary traditions on the planet, right. and oldest. But they didn't talk about memory when they ate, or when they cooked. But you go into a Jewish household or a black household, memory's gonna, gonna be there ready to slap you the minute you walk in the door. Right. Because you can't talk about kishka you can't talk about pacha, you can't talk about chitlins, you can't talk about hog jowls without talking about the material, economic, and cultural circumstances by which those dishes were invented. So obviously they, pr they prompt the youngest person in the room to ask, why the hell did we have to eat that? <laughs> <laughs> mm, I don't like that. And the answer is, is loaded with like, you know, black shame and Jewish guilt, because. <laughs> Ebonics, cuz. <laughs> when, your, when your bubby's bubby was in the shtetl, all they had was calves' feet. Black version. When your great great grandmama were down there in Mississippi, <laughs> all the masses would give them chitlins, all they had to eat. That's right. And they ate I've it. heard this speech. 
y'all, multiple times in both types of households. I know of what I speak. And it's not always the nasty stuff. I even had a friend joke to me, we should have like a black Yom Kippur Passover combo where we eat all the nasty stuff at one time, wash down with Kool-Aid. Grape Kool-Aid. Yeah, no, red. Red, it gotta be red. Tropical fruit punch. We always call it red with extra sugar. And I mean, just get the chitlins and the hog feet and the, and the jowl and all that other nonsense out of the way. Just, just the black, it's like the, the, the overdone black eyed peas, get them all, get it all out. And just suffer through it all together. You know, a little Seder plate of soul food funkiness. Um, you know, but you know, there's some of, this, some of the same stuff is there, right? Like the cracklings and the, um, and gribbiness. Which gribbiness, oh my God. Talk about a Jewish soul food you can only eat like once every 10 years. You know, it's, it's goose and chicken skin cooked in schmaltz with onions and it's delicious and I swear to God you will die from it <laughs> like the minute you start eating it, but it's so good. You know, that kind of thing. Um, so you, there's, a definite, there's definitely a feeling there. Um, it's the feeling and the intention and the memory more than it is the actual specifics. What's next, man? What's next? Oh, wow. So I really have to get into this next project about Judaism, me, and food. I mean, it's, that's going to be hard. I kind of put some, I've kind of put some things on the hanger to, to do this. Um, I'm still not done with this. Once you have the genealogy bug, you never end it. And once you get the genetic test bug, you never end it. <laughs> like, you know, I'm still looking for my later hosen in the mail. Um, <laughs> In a, as, when you're black, the commercial is like hilarious. <laughs> well, I thought I had to wear a later hosen, but I actually should be wearing a kilt. Get out of here. <laughs> Get out of here, seriously. Take it somewhere else. Not today, Satan, not today. Um, but for me, um, I, missed the, I missed the classroom. I missed teaching Hebrew school. I'll never go back there, though. I need a Nobel Prize just for that. <laughs> uh, Peace Prize, at least. Um, but I, I, I really want I really want things to be successful so that I could have my own nice kitchen. I guess that if I wanted anything else in the world, it'd be a nice kitchen for me and my partner to cook in, and and, and a huge garden again, so I can grow the things my grandmother grew. Because I have this feeling like every time I cook, my mother, blessed memory, comes back to life. My grandmother. Um, my daddy's still here. My grandfather, thank God. Poo 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 is still here. 99 years old. 18 children, 140 something living descendants. Oh, wow. Um, I'm, I'm blessed in so many ways, but there's some things I want so that I can really bring some more things to life. I really want people to know and understand that I don't want, I don't want to be the person this, that this tradition dies with. That is my greatest fear. It used to be being invisible to the world. I'm quite visible. <laughs> um, but, I, I, but I don't want this tradition to die with me. So I'm doing everything I can to make sure that 200 years from now, um, people remember not this, but they remember this, this, this train of tradition and that if nothing else, it didn't die with Michael Twitty. All right. <laughs> so we have, at this time, we have uh, time for some questions. So do we have uh, some questions out in the audience for Mr. Twitty? Don't be scared. Seriously. <laughs> Oh, slavery, point blank. Um, when in my ancestry did the Jewish ancestry to come in through slavery? Um, and, also, and, and, and it's, it's in there because I was, one, one thing that I talked about when I was a Hebrew school teacher was, I told you that question was coming, didn't I? Yeah, you did say I that. I totally said that was coming <laughs> upstairs. Was Ukraine. I didn't know why. Then it was because of the Baal Shem Tov. And then I saw 
then when I, my DNA stuff started coming in, I kept getting all these hits from people of Jewish ancestry in Ukraine. And it was like, okay, something's going on there. Um, and I didn't, I mean, we knew this. Everything that my, my, my people said was in the mix, was, ended up being in the mix, except for I didn't know about Madagascar <laughs> and Southeast Asia. That was brilliant. Because I'd heard about these people who came all the way across the ocean in slavery, and there's so many of us. That's the weird part. For a small population, there's so many of us. Uh, ben Jealous, the Wayans family, mm -hmm. uh, Maya Rudolph, um, Madagascar, Madagascar, Madagascar. Wow. So yeah, it, it was only a small population. But there are more African Americans with Jewish ancestry that came through Sephardic and uh, Ashkenazi folks than you think. It's really quite endemic. When I went to research uh, whether or not my, my great, great, great grandmother's people were free in South Carolina, but they were not. The free registry of Negroes in Charleston had so many pages with, with Jewish names it wasn't funny. There were like three pages of Cohen, three pages of Levy's. Um, um, Spa the Spanish Portuguese names mm -hmm. were all there. So these were all biracial, part Jewish black people who now have families of their own in, in freedom despite slavery, who still had relatives who were still enslaved to these same families. So um, yeah, everybody, there is a history there of all these different parts of my identity. And I didn't have all the space in the world to write all that up. I did talk about that a little bit. But yeah, it's, it's definitely a part of the story. Do we have any, right here? So the question is, how can we cultivate this love for history and culture, not just the cooking, but overall, and, and get, that, get that whole thing passed on? You got to start early. You gotta own it. It's all about ownership. Does a, does a child own this? For me, it was, I was the official taster, my grandmother's official taster. Now, I didn't know that was originally the position for the guy who was going to be poisoned. <laughs> but, you know... I sat at the table with her, and I didn't like every, I mean, I, the, there's a, the second chapter is called Hating My Soul. I point blank talk about not liking my own blackness, because I grew up in a time where, you know, we were shifting from black power to Reagan, and that affected everybody's conscious, conscious or lack thereof a consciousness. And also talked about how, for the average black kid growing up, especially in a time of fast food, when it really took off, soul food was noxious. Yeah. There were bones in the, bo in the plates. And it, what? There were no bones you played at McDonald's. Yeah. You get what I'm saying? And I think a lot of us who, I mean, when I talk to um, um, several of my Asian American friends and Latino friends about what that means to them, they're like, wait a minute, hold up. I remember when we used to get made fun of for the lunch we brought to school. And now it's, it's $20 for, for the same thing that you thought was gross, smelly Asian food, exotic, foreign. Now you overcharge and then you push me out of the narrative. How dare you? So we have to restore a respect to ourselves. Loving your food is like loving yourself. Loving your tradition is like loving yourself. And I, my grandmother literally had me sitting there with the snapping the beans and then I went from that to putting them in the, in the pan and that to cooking them, adjusting the seasonings. Does this taste right? Okay, I don't know. Da, da, da. Taste with me. And of course, my grandma did what your grandma did, which was we didn't put our spoon back in the pot to put it in our mouth. Mm -mm. What did we do? <laughs> what did she do? She did the same thing I saw in Africa. She put it on her on back her of her hand, hand and licked it, it off, washed her hand, and then that was that. So I, you know, I, I ownership. You have to, you have to, you, the, the kid's hand has to go into the dirt, okay? My daddy literally made me eat Virginia dirt. I'll never forget what that crazy fool did. 
But you know, I never forgot it. I never forgot when my daddy taught me about what segregation was. I mean, it's in the book. I was six years old. We were on the side of the road in North Carolina, and I said, I got to go to the bathroom, daddy. And he said, he handed me a jar. Told me to get out the car. Go to the side of the field. I brought it back to him. Because, you know, when you're six years old, someone tells you to go pee in a cup, you expect a cookie and juice. And he said, what are you doing? I said, look, hey, dude, cookie and juice. And he says, throw that out. And he said, I wanted you to understand the first time I came down here what it was like for me because I was colored. And I told my daddy, I said, well, you, you were like a Crayola? And Daddy laughed and he said, no, I said, we, were, we were black and they were white and we couldn't use the bathroom. My father is 78 now. My father, when he was 13, buried his great-grandfather, uh, great, great who was my great-great-great-granddaddy. He was born into slavery. So my hands have touched hands that were hands that touched an enslaved person, not very long ago. But again, from the time I was very little, the, everything, my parents were geniuses. Every poster, every book, every image was calculated to make me a proud black man one day. I th I'm thankful to them. You know, black folks, remember that, remember that what it, was it, Budweiser? Did that Kings and Queens of Africa poster? No, I didn't see that one. When I woke up every morning, that's the poster that I saw. That's what you are. You're not a basketball star. That, could, that lasts a second. No, you are Ose Tutu. You are Shaka. You are Mansa Musa. That's what you are. Go down in history like they did. And so when I, when I work with children, I would t children and teenagers, same thing, ownership. Put yourself in, this, in the shoes of your ancestors. Come on, imagine with me, think with me. Put yourself in their shoes. Okay, now let's do this. Let's do a project. Let's do this. Let's, let's, put, let's, let's get our hands moving. And those kids began to appreciate heritage, culture, food, tradition. Because then they realized something. They're, a, part of, they're, they're a, a bigger part of a chain, a chain of connection. And that's, what it, that's what it comes down to. And I had the pickiest eaters, and I had some children didn't have the sense God gave a pat of schmaltz. But you know what? I still taught them, and they still shined. Yes. All right, I thank you so much. We've had the blessing, the meal, and now dessert. Thank you so much for introducing Michael Twitty and Cliff Rome. On behalf of Chicago Humanities Festival, we thank you for joining us this evening. We thank our thank members you. supporting thank us this evening. Much. We thank you to First Ward Events, as well as Chop Shop for this wonderful venue. And I think you can pick up your dessert here at the book table and get it signed by Michael Twitty this evening. Thank you for joining us.